and welcome all of you to our briefing. Um, obviously, since Tuesday's meeting took place, there's less of you to come and enjoy these briefings every week. I don't know what... I'm sure I can say something controversial, so hang in there. So we'll start off with sharing uh, some updates on the CLAP social media town hall that's going to take place. Uh, Councilmember Clendenin's here. He's been leading that group. Uh, the CLAP Transformational Committee wants to hear from you. The committee, along with the help of WSU Public Policy Management Center, are engaging the community on next steps to transform CLAP. In May, the committee will make recommendations to the council, but they want to hear from you before then. So they'll be listening on a live from 1 to 3 p.m. meeting coming up for uh, information from the public on Facebook, Twitter, and next door. And then you can keep, you can tune in for that, share your ideas, and then they'll present to the council May 7th. I'm sure Councilmember Clendenin can add to that here in just a moment. Um, and so we'll just call him up now to talk about um, what he's doing in terms of that transformational committee. And then he's going to make an announcement on some funds he still has left over from the sale of the Hyatt. So James, why don't you come up and share? Mayor, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just a quick dovetail on the tr uh, CLAP transformation committee. Um, and the social media town hall, we're asking the whole community, not just those who live in Southeast Wichita, to please bring us your ideas. We want to make this a regional park. We want uh, the city of Wichita to think big and think about things that we already don't have in our park system. And so um, we're asking uh, for the, the public's input and hopefully through that social media town hall, uh, we can get some big ideas. Uh, that being said, in the fall of 2017, uh, St. Francis Community Services began establishing an independent living program at uh, the Mount of Wichita. Um, their mission is to provide housing, life skills training, education, substance abuse treatment, and child care services for foster age kids and young adults in need of assistance when they're released from state custody from the uh, foster care system. Uh, we know that this will be, uh, this is a delicate and formative time when many young people need uh, help and guidance, especially when they are parents themselves. And a lot of times when these um, uh, young adults and children go out of the system, they have no documentation and really no um, very few life skills. So the Mount Child Care and Early Education Center has been born. It is a joint venture between Child Start, St. Francis, and the Sisters of St. Joseph. Um, we believe that early childhood education is crucial, and they approached District 3 looking for grant funds to help them with their startup costs. The Sisters of St. Joseph provide rent-free space for this venture. Um, they have done an amazing thing, at giving, I think, close to half of the convent away uh, for use to St. Francis Community Services. They received $50,000 through the District 3 Hyatt Proceed Funds and have used it to further the project. It will be used to serve 20 children at the current time. It's kind of their, their kickoff. Child Start is providing the early education program, and other partners such as Cox Communications are helping them with other needs. Here to tell us more is Trish Bryant, Vice President of Residential Services with the St. Francis Community Services. Trish. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here today and thank you for the invitation to discuss the great services that are being provided to some of the young children in the city of Wichita. We greatly appreciate the funding that was provided to us to help this collaboration. 
A big thank also goes out to the Congregation of the Sister of St. Joseph's for welcoming us to the Mount so that we can use that space to provide services to children and families. A special thank you to the Council for providing funding for us for the Early Head Start and Head Start programs. We work together with the Sisters of St. Joseph and the Child Start program located here in Wichita. With the funding we receive from the City Council, and the funds that you provided, we were able to transform some of the space in the former convent that the sisters lived in. We took the first floor, and as we say on bent knee, we put in carpeting and small furniture and tables and created an environment for those children where they can thrive. Why is it so important for Child Start, Head Start, and Early Head Start, St. Francis, and the city of Wichita to work together? because we're giving all these children a head, a head start and a foot up in life. We're helping children. We're paving the way for their success. Some of the statistics that I saw in working with the Head Start program, that this isn't just about the children, but it's also about the families and us working together to help parenting skills and help them be better families. It's often true that kids at our disadvantage aren't given the same opportunities that kids that have advantages. And so this then equals the playing field for everyone. It's also about health and wellness. It's about more kids graduating more often. And the other very interesting thing that we saw is that as parents have children in the early Head Start and Head Start programs, it's often very frequent that the parents themselves then go back to school and finish their education or pursue secondary education. So I think this was uh, money that was well invested. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. One of the other interesting facts that I did see was this was from James, James Heckerman, the Nobel Laureate in Economics at the University of Chicago. They state that for every dollar that's invested in a Head Start program, the community re receives $9 in return because those children are more likely to become gainfully employed. They're more likely to finish their education and be contributing members of society. So thank you all. Uh, Trish, uh, thank you so much. Um, serving our children is important not only the little children, but also the teenage children and those children coming out of the foster system that have children. And so this is going to be a, a wonderful program to help make sure that um, we are giving uh, kids a leg up. And the whole point is to break that cycle of poverty that we see happening so much in areas of our city. So that being said, Mayor, thank you for the time. Shit. Council member, thank you, Trish. Thank you. And just a reminder, Councilmember Clendenin and also took some of those proceeds and put it into Wichita Promise that we're providing scholarship opportunities to those in some disadvantaged neighborhoods to get skills training to uh, provide opportunity for better paying jobs that can transform generations to come. So you're a little bit about transforming your part of the city and helping people get an opportunity to have a hand up. Um, talking about the library, there's a great event happening, the position of race within criminal justice system strategies for reform will be presented at the Advanced Learning Library next Thursday, March 28th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Experts representing the police, courts, corrections will identify and discuss specific strategies to reduce racial disparities in the criminal justice, justice system and allow the to continue the momentum of recent criminal justice reform efforts. The discussion will be moderated by Michael Berger, a criminal justice professor at Wichita State University. As you know, we have proved baseball this past Tuesday. You can see um, a satellite image of what's going on over there at the ballpark. They are working towards completion. We still plan to be playing games in the spring of 2020. You can watch the stadium progress in real time at wichita.gov slash stadium. And certainly want to encourage those that are fighting insomnia to tune in at any time in your evening. 
It's better than watching paint dry. So we want the community to feel involved and be able to follow along at the progress speed of this stadium's coming together and, and uh, stay tuned for more announcements as we can bring them to you. I wanna recognize Council Member Tuttle who's joined us and um, Council Member Fry, everyone's formerly favorite vice mayor. And at this point we'll open it up for questions. So the big question of the week is your statement made at Tuesday City Council meeting about the empty Gander Mountain building, um, a tenant going in there that would bring 700 jobs to the area. Um, can you elaborate on that and, and explain what you meant by all that? Sure, happy to. And, and, and let me start off with saying again what I said uh, that evening that maybe got lost in the translation somewhere. I started off that conversation with that was another mayor, another council, different time, and we recognize the shortfallings that Water Walk has had to fight through. My bigger point is this. We have reconstructed all of our agreements going forward with safeguards in place, with performance guarantees in place. But I don't believe that it does this community any good to continually cite the failings of Water Walk. No one wants to associate with a failure. We recognize it had some shortcomings. But every time we pick up a newspaper, every time someone wants to compare a future deal, they cite Water Walk as a failure. That needs to stop, community. If we're going to come together and promote Wichita, we need to quit this notion that we have a failure and it's going to remain a failure and it'll be a failure for 32 more decades. That needs to stop. We've got to figure out how to promote that. My point is, and being transparent, we were briefly updated by the city manager that they are in some kind of talks. That there could potentially be up to 700 jobs. That's not something I invented. It was a briefing by the city manager to me. And as we continue to occasionally get criticized about not bringing forth these opportunities, now we're getting criticized when we say, hey, we've heard talks that they are looking at some opportunities to make that water walk a success again. So the reality is we get it both ways. We get criticized because we haven't shared that we know something's going on. We get criticized for sharing that we heard something's going on. And if we're gonna get criticized both ways, so be it. What I'm encouraging is this community doesn't continually say failure, failure, failure. Let's figure out how to fix some of those shortcomings and pull together as a community and make Wichita a better place. Because we believe in Wichita. We believe that it's not going to be a failure for future generations. So with 700 or around 700 jobs being the number given uh, that would come to that area, uh, many people are thinking it could be a call center, something of that nature. So Can I you tell us? So I couldn't even be? tell you what it is. No one has given me any details. So maybe my lesson learned is we don't share anything until we have definitive information. I'm not sure what the correct answer is. Certainly we wanna try and be as transparent as possible. We'll give you updates when we get updates. All we know is there's an opportunity to make Water Walk potentially more successful. The number given to me by Bob Layton, our city manager was, they're talking about potentially 700 jobs we don't know what kind of jobs they are. They're in negotiations. Now we heard from Jack DeBoer that maybe those negotiations failed. That's the update. But in our effort to be transparent and in our effort to quit calling everything a failure and bring this community together, we're going to share. And I think we should. 
well, a more positive angle for Water Walk. Talk about the future of it. Um, I'm guessing y'all's focus is still on Water Walk and that development. Um, what about the money that was given for that development in past years? Where is that now? And what can people of Wichita expect that area to be in the coming decades? So we still believe Water Walk has a lot of potential. And certainly now with uh, some of the other things that we're working on, with the, with the new baseball stadium, with the... Uh, Baseball Village with the excitement centered around that with some of the other discussions. It's bound to we think Cross over the river into some of these other areas. They have potential They have potential not to be a failure And so we don't know what it can become I'm sure we can provide you a list of all of the dollars that were spent that were committed by a different mayor and a different council and we're happy to provide that we can surely give some kind of update on what those dollars were and what the direction is going forward. But we still have hopes that there's opportunities to help make that successful. But continuing to call it a failure and to continue to point out the shortcomings, I don't believe is helpful. Uh, moving to another topic, the Clap Golf Course. Um, we've heard that the new design features something that doesn't have a golf course whatsoever. Can you talk or should? Mr. So Clinton I haven't been in that? any of those meetings, okay, to well. be fair. <laughs> right. So Councilmember McClendenin has headed up that committee. He has brought the people together that uh, sit on that committee. So I'll let him address that. Thanks, Mayor. So the Transformation Committee, just to clarify, is made up of citizens and stakeholders from around the area. And that Transformation Committee is made up of neighborhood association presidents. We have um, some urban design professionals and that sort of thing from the area, uh, all appointed um, by me and um, approved by the city manager. Um, that committee is right now just in their listening phase. So all they're doing right now is getting input from the community. What does this community want? There's been no design. There's been no decisions made. As a matter of fact, I, let, me, let me go backwards. There was one decision made by the park board and the park board decided that they were gonna close clap as an 18 hole golf course. So um, moving forward, whatever ideas come out, um, it's been, oh my gosh, it's been anything from sledding hills to outdoor ice rinks to walking paths to a senior center to all sorts of big things, zip line courses, ropes courses, um, you name it, the community's thought of it. And so we're continuing just to get that input. They will have a recommendation uh, to the city council in a public meeting by May early May sometime. Even at that point, there will not be a design, there will not be a master plan or anything in place. Uh, so um, we just want the community to know that we haven't made any decisions and that we really need, especially at this town hall, to get public input. And what if that public input includes people wanting a golf course? Would y'all look at that again? Or? Well, I think that the golf, the, they did a comprehensive study of the golf system and the comprehensive study really showed that we cannot, the system cannot sustain 18 holes. Uh, there has also been discussion of a nine hole course. Um, there's also some very big concern that even a nine hole course is still gonna tax the system enough. Uh, so right now, yes, we, there are people that are having that discussion that are putting that on the table. Um, we just need to make sure whatever happens that it is going to help the golf system and the park system be better than it is today. Yeah. Thanks. And then one last question, and I'll be quiet, guys, for the mayor, um, to close the whole water walk conversation unless someone else has a question. Um, you talk about the negativity that the news and, and all that has brought um, here this week. But can you understand the frustration for those residents who have paid $700,000 for the condos there or the businesses who have moved in there hoping that development would come? I know that was, uh, those were city leaders before you, um, but do you understand that frustration and, and understand why people are asking these questions? So probably understand it better than most. 
So my uh, mother is one of them that bought a condo in Water Walk. She lives in Water Walk. She's getting ready to move out of there because unfortunately she needs to move into a assisted living center now at her age. So I get it, people have invested and people want to see something grow there. But I, in my own personal opinion, I don't believe continuing to call it a failure is the way to move it forward. I think we need to rally the community in a different way than just pointing out that it hasn't lived up to what its potential is and calling it a failure continually. I don't believe is the perfect strategy to figure out how to move it forward. Hi, Mayor. Uh, I wanted to ask again about the uh, Wichita Riverfront LP and whether the uh, list of names has been provided either to you or if it'll be made uh, publicly available. So, so they will be made public available, and I and I believe, and and we can do some research and help you with this. I think anytime anyone files with the state of Kansas, they have to file uh, all of the primary owners of that with the state of Kansas. But in the development agreement. It has a stipulation in there that the development agreement cannot be triggered until they name all of the owners of that agreement. Okay. Yeah, because uh, the Secretary of State does not list, it doesn't list the, those, those documents don't list all the owners. So that's something we'd still need. Yeah. Um, also had a question about, um, <clears throat> water walk and and the 700 jobs and sort of the timing the timing of the uh, the announcement are, are you saying that uh, that kind of makes you hesitant to give more details going forward on on any kind of projects kind so, of public so here's my that? point again communities asking for full transparency I received a briefing from the city manager that they potentially are working on an opportunity to put up to as many as 700 jobs in Water Walk. Don't know the details, probably should say updates available as we get them. That's typically how negotiations work. The first day they start negotiating, they don't have a deal done yet. And sometimes negotiations, as we've learned, like Cargill, like baseball, can take over a year. So at what point in time does the media and the community want to hear that, hey, we know that there's something going on. We don't have all of the details, but, but here's what we know. And at that point, that's all we know. And I'm happy to provide that. But I'm not happy to get criticized for providing that when that's all we know at this point. So do you want updates or do you not want updates? Updates. So, um, so why criticize me for it? Well, my question, I guess now is, uh, what, if you could do this from, just backpedal, three weeks to now, uh, or even months ago, was there anything you would change about the way the baseball uh, how we got to this point today. So, so I can tell you in my nearly 60 years on this planet, I've gotten really good at hindsight vision. And there's always opportunities to improve everything that we do. And we certainly could have said the same thing. We couldn't have given any details, but we certainly could have shared, hey, we have one more development agreement that we don't have finalized yet. Now we thought we were going to have it finalized. And understand this, the council or the mayor did not participate at the negotiating table of trying to finalize those agreements. That was all staff sitting in those meetings. It was Robert Layden, it was Scott Rigby, it was um, our baseball consultant, and it was the baseball team. And Scott Rigby, I think, is still here unless he walked out that um, I don't know can share anything else to that, but we could have said we have one final agreement to finish. 
but we still couldn't have given the details of that agreement. And that gets lost in the translation somewhere. People just assume, well, why didn't you share the details? We could have said we have one more agreement, but we could not have shared the details of that. Now, up until we announced those first two agreements that were signed in October, baseball didn't let us say anything. That was very clear by minor league baseball up to that point, even though we've been negotiating for nearly a year. We weren't allowed to say anything at that point. But when we had the first of the three agreements, the first two agreements signed in October, we could have and should have said, we still have one more agreement in place that we think that we're about done with. But we still would not have been allowed to share the details of that agreement. Thanks. And uh, my next question is about CLAP. Uh, if you know, are there any are there any ideas that are sort of off the table before before people start commenting and throwing out casino or you know a lot of things <laughs> you see in there? So, this is what I'm telling everybody. First of all, I'm telling everybody to dream up here because you'll probably get maybe down here. Don't dream way down here because you're going to get something that's down on the floor. So first of all, we do want people to think big. We do want people, but we want people to think about park-related development, uh, things that would uh, support the use of a park, the things that would support people enjoying themselves uh, in a park environment. Um, uh, I would say the one thing that is definitely off the table is an 18-hole golf course. The park board who actually owns the property has made that decision. Um, but anything that's park-related that um, could support a quality of life in a park-type setting, that type of development is what we're looking at. I hope that helps clarify. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, you bet. Anything else? Thank you all for coming. <laughs>